Consumers want to know the facts about the products they buy, but America's agricultural landscape is not easy to navigate. Between different companies, scientific advancement, government regulations, advertisement campaigns, and an unhealthy amount of myth and misconception, anyone would be hard-pressed to make sense of it. That's where Real Ag comes in. Kyle Bauer and the Real Ag crew bring you truthful, unbiased information about real agricultural concerns. From the producers who make your food, to the store where you buy the final product, and everything in between. This is Real Ag. Now, here's your host, Kyle Bauer. Every day, millions of people use canola in one form or another. Yet most of them have no idea what canola is. Canola is our topic today on Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by... Servitech has been helping producers across the Midwest make the planet more productive since 1975. We are proud sponsors of Real Ag, helping tell the story of how your food makes it to your plate. The Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by farmers. What exactly is canola? Canola is being introduced into Oklahoma and Kansas as an alternative crop to be grown in rotation with wheat. Uh, winter canola is what we grow, which is different than what uh, spring canola is in the northern plains or in Canada. So with winter canola, we're planting it in the fall, harvesting it in the summer like we do a winter wheat. So a very similar life cycle in re that regard. However, it is a different crop because, than wheat because it is a winter broadleaf crop, which we don't have a lot of options when it comes to broadleaves that we can grow over the winter months. It's in the same family as, 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 as mustard. It's the mustard family. Uh, it's a brass, brassicaceae. Um, so people that are familiar with, with all the wild mustards, it's in that same, same family. We really uh, uh, do not have any other cool season broadleaf crop in the, in the state other than you know, alfalfa, which would be a perennial. So, it's, so it's, uh, it's a nice new crop that we can integrate into our cropping systems. It gives us more crop diversification. Probably the most common question that I get about canola oil is where does it come from? And a lot of people think that it comes from corn. But it's interesting to me that uh, consumers don't know uh, that canola is produced from the canola plant. Uh, and they also don't understand that it is a healthy vegetable oil uh, that can improve heart health if they supplement it into their diet. And so I think there are some real advantages to growing canola in the Southern Great Plains, one to diversify our cropping systems. The other is that it's truly a health benefit to, benefit to consumers uh, to use canola oil in cooking and um, the variety of purposes that it can, it can be used for. Canola was, was bred and developed from rapeseed and historically they used the rapeseed oil for kerosene lamps and that kind of thing. When that industry died away then uh, they bred uh, canola. Well, in fact, canola is rapeseed, but not all rapeseed is canola. So canola has to have uh, specific factors uh, in both its meal and in the oil that make it canola quality. So canola quality rapeseed was first developed in Canada, and that's really where the name comes from. So the, the C-A-N comes from Canada. Ola sounds like oil put them together and you, you get canola. So that's where the term comes from. Canola production in, in, in Canada really took off after World War II when, when they developed the crop from, from rapeseed. And it's uh, very common in, in North Dakota, Montana, uh, in, the, in the High Plains. Rapeseed uh, typically has around 45% erucic acid in the oil. And erucic acid is a fatty acid that is um, detrimental to human health. So if you consume large quantities of erucic acid, it'll basically cause heart failure. So what the Canadians did was reduce that level of erucic acid down to uh, two percent or less. So in order for rapeseed to be classified as canola, it must have two percent or less erucic acid in the oil. The other uh, factor that makes canola canola quality is a reduction in the glucosinolates in the meal. And what the glucosinolates are 
are they are a group of sulfur containing proteins that are detrimental to uh, animal health. So if a monogastric animal, uh, a simple stomach animal like a, a hog or a chicken would consume large quantities of the meal with this glucosinolate in it, it can cause some pretty serious uh, health problems. Because canola has low levels of glucosinolate in the meal, it can be fed to um, a monogastric animal. Canola is really new to this region and uh, Traditionally, uh, there's been a lot of spring canola grown, and that was uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, down in Oklahoma, uh, they, were, they started doing some work and found that uh, canola fit very well, winter canola fit very well into that system down there and provided some crop rotation with winter wheat. And uh, so, and, and from there, it has grown quite a, to quite a number of acres in, in, in Oklahoma and, and and uh, Kansas. Historically, all the production acres has been in, in uh, largely in Canada, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Washington, and that's all spring canola. So, so our area grows the winter canola because spring canola will uh, burn burns up with our, our our early hot springs in the summer. That that crop, just like spring wheat, does not do well in Kansas. Spring canola does not do well in Kansas, and so. We grow winter canola for that reason. So in our area, we don't have the disease problems that they have have in Canada. Canada is, is actually maxed out on, on the amount of acres they can grow. They would like to, to grow more acres, but they're maxed out. And so the U.S. Import, imports about two and a half million acres worth of production every year. So the production uh, potential in the U.S. is, is, is huge you know, we, to meet just our own U.S. demand. And so uh, you know that that's 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 excellent that we have that kind of demand for that crop and the demand for for growing it in our in our region. What are the properties of canola? Canola is is in the mustard family, and so its seed is very similar to what a mustard what you're familiar with mustard seed. Um, and there's probably six or eight canola seed equal to the size of one kernel of wheat. Canola has a very small seed size, so the diameter of a canola seed is about two millimeters, so a very small seed, the smallest seed of about any commercial crop that uh, is commonly grown in the United States. So that can be challenging um, for farmers in that uh, since it is a small seed, it can be hard to meter in equipment. And that small of a seed needs to be seeded very, placed very shallow in the soil. Uh, you know, an inch and a half at the most, preferably half inch to an inch, the crop seems to do very, very well. So there may be some things that producers may, may need to do to their equipment uh, to get that um, drill, for instance, to meter the seed to a recommended seeding rate. It's oftentimes a problem in western Kansas that in the fall time of the year, our soils are dry, the wind blows a lot, and so trying to get a crop established from that, that shallow of a, a depth can be, a, can be a real challenge. So we can't plant canola deeper than an inch. And so with some of our worn out equipment that we sometimes use on our farms, getting uh, even uh, seeding depth can be a challenge. And that, we find that that's really important for canola, that it needs to be planted within in that inch to half inch uh, seeding depth to get a good stand. Where it fits very well in our western Kansas environment is under irrigation, and the crop requires uh, does not require as much water as a fully irrigated corn crop, for example. And so, in western Kansas, you know we are extracting water from the Ogallala Aquifer, and as we all know, the majority of the Ogallala Aquifer has has seen well capacity decline over over years, and and really there's only a few places. That's a small, the small percentage of the area that, that uh, are still have the same kind of well capacity that they had when they first started pumping. So we, we see canola being a, a nice crop to fit into that system that does not require near as much water as, as a corn crop does. Uh, it's grown in a, on, a, on the off time of the year so that a person could split a pivot and grow an irrigated corn crop on half of the pivot and a, and a canola crop on the other half of the pivot. So it takes less pressure and demand off of that, off of that irrigation capacity. So we, we really see it as a, as a good crop to integrate into our, onto our cropping systems out here. It's a broadleaf crop, which we don't 
we do not have a good broadleaf crop for western Kansas. Soybean really struggles on high pH soils. Canola does well on, under high pH soils. So we really see it as a, as a good uh, rotational crop for us. One of the main advantages advantages to growing both broadleaf and grass crops in our Kansas cropping systems is the ability to use different classes of herbicides to control weeds. When we're talking about grass crops, we're talking about wheat, corn, milo that are very common in Kansas. The broadleaf crops that we commonly grow are alfalfa, soybean, and sometimes cotton. So canola is a broadleaf, so it fits in with that class of crops that we grow in rotation with our common grass crops in the state. And that's one of the big advantages for winter canola in our region is being able to control uh, grassy weed species that plague wheat production and by using a class of herbicides that will control them easily in winter canola. So we're talking about products uh, like Roundup uh, that can be sprayed for a broad spectrum control as well as other uh, grass herbicides that we can't use in wheat. In Oklahoma, where they've grown it in South Central, where we've grown it now, and we have some research on, on that has shown this. Uh, not only do we get the weed control benefit of growing the canola crop and being able to control these grassy weeds, but even in the absence of grassy weeds and just putting canola in in rotation with winter wheat, we we, we see we see about a 10 to 15 percent yield increase of, of the of the wheat crop following canola versus wheat following wheat. So, you know, there are other things occurring. Not only are we helping to manage the weed angle, but we're, we're but from, from insect, from insect disease, we're get we're, we're creating a break in that, in that system, managing some of these other crop paths. Also, canola produces a, a, a tap root where grass and wheat produce more of a fibrous root. So that tap root, uh, and a tap root is, is a root that, uh, if you think about a mustard, when you pulled it out of the ground, it, it, it's this large, very large single uh, main tap root that creates a large uh, pore, soil pore in the ground, and where we also think that that can help us um, increase water infiltration. So when we get a big rain event, we can we can increase the amount of water that that uh, soaks into the soil before running off. So it has some soil health benefits in addition to all the pest management benefits. Well, the primary product from canola is the oil and we're all pretty familiar with canola oil because it's in a lot of our kitchens across uh, the Great Plains and, and the world for that matter. It's a, a very popular vegetable oil, a very healthy vegetable oil. When you compare canola oil to the other vegetable oils that are, are commonly used, canola has the lowest level of saturated fat of any commercially available vegetable oil. So it's healthier than, say, olive oil in terms of its uh, saturated fat content. It also has very high levels of oleic acid, which improves the stability of the oil, so it has a long shelf life. It also has a, a long fry length, and it's very popular for restaurants for that reason. Canola also has essential fatty acids for our diet. So here we're talking about linolenic and linoleic acid. It produces high levels of both those fatty acids, which are important for us to consume in our diets because we can't produce those, uh, those fatty acids. So overall, canola is a very healthy oil uh, that we consume. It can also be used as a biofuel. Uh, typically, your high stability vegetable oils also make very good uh, biodiesel feedstocks. So that's why the biodiesel that's used in um, countries like Canada and in the European Union are made from canola oil because they have a very high stability and can be used in colder temperatures. So another byproduct of canola seed is canola meal, which has uh, a protein content that is in the upper 20s or low 30s, which is very comparable to what soybean meal is. And soybean meal is a very popular meal that's used uh, in the United States. Uh, canola meal is also very popular because uh, it has um, a slightly higher fat content than what soybean meal does. Canola meal is popular with dairies in particular because they've shown that feeding canola meal increases milk production as well. So uh, there are some benefits to, um, to using canola meal. So winter canola was first introduced in the Southern Great Plains as a way to grow better wheat. We needed a way to improve both wheat quality and yield. 
And so some researchers at both Kansas State and Oklahoma State looked at winter canola as being an option for producers who traditionally grow wheat uh, for year after year after year. Canola is a broadleaf and wheat is a grass crop. Growing them in rotation gives producers a way to control grassy weed species, also pests and diseases that often plague wheat when it is grown in a continuous uh, cropping system. Like all crops, canola has specific requirements for planting and growing. So the climate conditions that we often face in the southern Great Plains can be very challenging and they can be especially challenging for our summer crops that we commonly grow, so uh, corn and soybeans. Uh, the weather conditions in uh, Kansas and Oklahoma can be very variable at times and it can go from drought in the early part of the year to uh, flooding in the fall or vice versa. Canola grows at a time period when it can utilize moisture at a, a cooler uh, part of the growing season. So the spring and the fall is when uh, the moisture demand for canola is the highest and that's often uh, when we see beneficial rains. Uh, the temperatures are also cooler so evapotranspiration um, is less and so winter canola can utilize the cooler and wetter periods of the growing season uh, to produce grain and that's another benefit for growing it in the southern Great Plains. Historically in this area we, we had a lot of issues with winter canola surviving the winter and uh, it would only survive the winter about 25 percent of the time. We found that we needed to plant that, that crop about a month ahead of winter wheat and if we planted it about a month earlier then we've had a winter, successful winter crop uh, every year. If we plant it like the same time as we would typically plant winter wheat, then about 75% of the time the crop winter kills. Producers have adopted several different kinds of planting practices. Um, it's very important that the plant where you place the seed, there's no residue. So we need to move any of that residue, that previous last year's crop stubble out of the way to get that crop to survive the winter. If we have a lot of residue in, that, in the same area as, as the crop is trying to overwinter, then what we, we get is that is the growing point of the plant is elevated above the soil surface and it's exposed to the cold temperatures rather than being right near the soil, soil surface and kept warm and so then we have increased winter kill. So canola is a unique crop in that it can be grown in a variety of ways. And we've seen producers in the southern Great Plains experiment uh, with different row spacings. Uh, canola has the ability to branch out and, co and compensate when it has a poor stand. And so that makes it able to be grown in a variety of row spacings. So canola is very forgiving that we can either plant it on a narrow row spacing with a drill or plant it on a road space, wide row spacing with a planter and get very good yields in either method. But the two things to keep in mind are really critical is planting date, planting, planting it early in the fall to get a large enough plant to, that will overwinter and survive the winter and then also managing so that, that residue right in the seed zone, move that out of the way. Uh, we do those two things and we can have very good winter survival and very good yield. Agronomic practices for winter canola are very similar to what they are for winter wheat in the region. So we're planting it in the fall. Some producers will use a very low level of our fertilizer in row with canola. So we use lower levels of fertilizer in row with canola because it is an oil seed and, and can tend to uh, salt out or you'll see a, a stand reduction if you use a high level of fertility in row. Uh, but we have seen some benefit to in row fertility in the fall. Nitrogen requirements are very similar to winter wheat. Um, it, it has the seed is very high in, in, in protein content and the crop requires a little bit higher level of sulfur than some of our uh, than, than wheat and some of our other crops. So sulfur, sulfur is very important um, but it can be really managed pr pretty very similarly to how you would manage wheat from a fertilizer standpoint. So you'll see producers planting um, winter canola in the month of September in Kansas. And when it emerges, it'll often look like a turnip or a radish um, because it is a crop that is very closely related to those um, other brassica crops which we might grow in our gardens. Harvesting canola is somewhat different than other crops. The harvesting the crop is, uh, there are several different methods of harvesting. 
There is a, a direct cut method where we just bring the combine in the field and, and harvest it like, like wheat. Some of the reasons we would swath winter canola in the southern Great Plains is to protect the crop from, from the wind. So canola is a crop that is prone to shatter and so that's something that we need to keep in mind uh, when it comes to harvest. The pod will contain uh, quite a number of seed, you know, up six, eight seed on, on some larger pods, um, even maybe even a few more. When those pods are, are mature and, and ripe, they will, they will bust open very, very easily. It, so it's very easy to, when we thrash the, and process the, the seed through the combine, it's very easy to get the seed out. Well, a strong wind event can, can result in seed, seed shattering and, and loss on the ground. So to minimize that, um, we can windrow the crop using a draper header on a swather. Probably the most popular method right now is swathing the crop and then coming back after it is ripened in the windrow and picking it up with the combine. And so if you have a lot of acres to harvest and cannot cover them in a very timely manner, then what we can do is, is, is earlier when the pods are just starting to turn in color, when the pod is, the, the seed is in the pod, then we can come in and swath that field. To swath canola, you would cut the canola with what's called a swather and lay the crop into a windrow. And in that windrow, the crop will cure. Uh, Windrowing is a way that we harvest hay in um, the southern Great Plains, Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, and so as this approach to harvesting canola is similar. Uh, the equipment is a little bit different uh, than um, what we use to harvest hay. But the process is very similar in that you're cutting the crop and laying it in a windrow so that it'll, it will ripen uh, in the windrow. Harvesting is a very timely uh, needs to be a very timely process uh, because the longer the crop stands in the field mature and ripe, the more likely that you may have a strong wind or a thunderstorm come in and, and shatter the crop out and that's something that we don't want to happen. So one of the advantages to swathing is to um, cut the crop off and lay that crop in a windrow so that it is protected from the wind and the elements. We've seen swath canola withstand uh, severe thunderstorms in Kansas and Oklahoma because it was laying in the windrow and protected uh, somewhat from the elements. So it is a way to prepare the crop, uh, also to get the crop out of, uh, out of the field quicker, and that's important to producers. Another challenge with the small seed size would be harvesting. And the main problem there is that we just need to be aware of the holes in our equipment. And we often recommend to producers that are harvesting canola to have either a roll of duct tape or caulking or axle grease handy uh, to fill any holes that they might have in either their combine or, or their, uh, their trucks. Um, because of that small seed size, canola does like to flow. And so those are some things that we just need to be aware of uh, when we're handling the crop at harvest. What is the future of canola planting and production? I might be a little bit biased in my answer, but I really think the future for canola is very bright in the Southern Great Plains, in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. We uh, consume over four or five million acres worth of production in the United States alone. So we are an importer of canola grain, canola meal, and canola oil into the United States. So there's a tremendous opportunity for U.S. producers to meet that demand for the product uh, in the United States. So with canola having tremendous health benefits in our diet, uh, we see the demand for the crop not going away anytime soon. So we really would encourage uh, producers that are considering canola to try planting it on their farms for that reason. Um, because it is in such a high demand, it also has a high value. And that's important uh, to all of us, uh, that farm. So over the past seven or eight years, we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of acres in the Southern Great Plains. And Oklahoma is, is really leading the charge there. 
eight years ago we had around five or ten thousand acres planted in Oklahoma and now we're pushing 300 to 350 thousand acres and all signs point to that increasing to around a million acres or more in the next five or ten years and the reason we've seen that increase in acres is produ producers have seen that rotation benefit to canola or to canola in their their wheat cropping systems uh, they've also oftentimes grossed more revenue with canola because it typically has a three or four dollar per bushel price premium uh, to winter wheat and so they're seeing a greater returns economically with canola in rotation uh, with winter wheat. If you look at Kansas, uh, we've increased acres over the last 10 years from a few hundred to over 60,000 uh, this past cro uh, cropping season. And we expect to be over 100,000 acres in the next one or two years. And uh, again, we really feel like, uh, especially in the areas where we grow a lot of wheat continuously in the state of Kansas, the canola would really benefit our cropping systems. That wraps up this episode of Real Ag. Remember, you can see every episode of this series by going to SmokyHillsTV.org. Until next time, I'm Kyle Bauer, and this has been Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by... Servitech has been helping producers across the Midwest make the planet more productive since 1975. We are proud sponsors of Real Ag, helping tell the story of how your food makes it to your plate. The Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by farmers.